This evening I'll be talking about uh, text and social network data. Um, I first should acknowledge uh, a lot of the work that I'll be describing is work with collaborators, indeed uh, other people's work as well. Uh, so I've listed here some of my students, collaborators, and various funding agencies uh, that have helped uh, support all of this work. Um, a few minutes ago, uh, the 10-year award was mentioned from Helsinki, and in fact, I spoke at that meeting. It was uh, a lot of fun, and basically spoke for an hour about this equation, which is a basic equation for a finite mixture model, where uh, we have a density function on x, and we decompose that into components and weights uh, for each of the k different uh, uh, components. And uh, today, uh, after 10 years, I'm coming back with a new equation, uh, very similar, uh, except you'll notice that there's a dependence on an extra variable here, d. Uh, so hopefully, the, the, uh, uh, I'll have a little bit more to say than this, but uh, it, as we get older, we realize there are a lot of commonalities in what we do. So. Uh, this is basically the topic model equation where now the mixture coefficients depend on the individual document rather than being uh, global. All right, so let me start by motivating the talk with a few examples, and I just picked Facebook just because uh, there happened to be some nice slides lying around, but there are many other data sets like this, and I think computer science really is changing rapidly, uh, and machine learning is a very big part of that, uh, and data mining, as uh, these data sets are kind of a forcing function on us in terms of what are we going to do with all of this data. So Facebook has, you know, by their own accounts, order of 500 million users, give or take a few hundred million. Um, and the amount of data that they collect, for example, the graph that they have on average, each one, user has about 130 other users they're connected to. So you get a graph with 60 billion edges, and you can imagine trying to analyze that kind of data. In addition to the network, they also get, uh, you know, by their own uh, slides, 30 billion pieces of content every month and uh, three billion photos. So this kind of uh, interlinked data is, uh, provides all kinds of interesting opportunities that even 10 years ago, when many of us were in Helsinki, it, it was unimaginable that we could get access to data like this. And of course, we may not have Facebook data, but there are many other data sets similar to this that we, we can think of working with. Even at the individual level, if we're not a Facebook, we just have our own data, uh, the amount of data that, that, that we're collecting is, is, is still staggering. Some of you may be aware of uh, Stephen Wolfram. Uh, on his blog, he posted recently uh, all of his email data. This is from 1990 up to 2012. Uh, every dot here is an email sent, uh, email received, I don't remember exactly, as a function of time of day. And it, it's interesting to look at uh, sort of his behavior over this time. Uh, for example, this is when he slept, there was relatively little email, and it was getting later and later, and then I believe this is when one of his, his books came out, so he kind of did a re, uh, reboot and got back into more normal schedule. Uh, you can also see uh, things like evening time and so forth. So um, there, there, we're, we're going to increasingly be collecting this kind of data, um, as, as most of us are aware, uh, not just for things like email, but also health type of data exercise with sensors all around us and so forth. So this kind of individual uh, data analysis is going to become more and more important. Um, it's not just computer scientists and, um, uh, that are collecting this kind of data. Again, uh, if you start walking around your campus, you'll realize that all your colleagues in other departments are becoming involved in, in, in data collection. So this is an example from history. One of the interesting things that's happening in history is they're digitizing many texts, turning them into ASCII. Previously, a uh, historian would have to go to the library, look at microfiche, it would be a slow process. Now they have access to all of their data at their fingertips. So the Pennsylvania Gazette is, um, was probably the most famous newspaper in the United States uh, in its time. It was founded by Benjamin Franklin, and a lot of very interesting information there for historians studying US history. Recently became available in the last few years online, and you can imagine trying to study this just using keyword search. Um, not so easy. Uh, so historians are interested, and, and humanities in general, in, in looking for tools that can help them analyze these very large amounts of text and rather than having to read every single document. 
Okay, so common themes that you're going to see, and again, uh, many of you are very familiar with these ideas. Um, in fact, there's many people in the audience who've worked on, on, on many of the techniques I will talk about, will be you know, taking this rich data, and what we do in machine learning and data mining is flatten it and make it as simple as possible, put it into vector and matrix form so we can do, use our usual nice analytical tools. So we'll be talking about matrices with N documents and W words, bag of words type representation, or for uh, social network data, square matrices, where we're looking at uh, perhaps just binary entries or perhaps uh, counts. And what, what, where I think it gets interesting is when we have additional side information, which you pretty much always do in practice. So we don't usually just have the documents and the words or the social network. We often also have uh, metadata in the sense of time when the, when the information was recorded or we may have multiple copies of the information at different times. We may have covariates attributes, authors of the documents, what journal did it appear in or what source. Um, and sometimes we'll have supervised information as well. And I'll say a little bit more about that later. So why, why use latent variables? Um, part of the, the, the issue is with many of these data sets, there really isn't, a, you can't just turn it into a standard classification or regression problem. You're dealing with data that, uh, that there just isn't an obvious target variable to work with. And um, so latent variables, when you're trying to model high dimensional data, can be, can be very handy, very useful, at least the way that they tend, tend to be used. And one of the things from a probabilistic point of view is that we use uh, some kind of conditional independence assumption to uh, simplify the model and essentially make the, say, the, the nodes in a network or the words in a document conditionally independent of each other given the latent variable. And you'll see this pattern over and over again with all of these latent variable models. One of the things I'll try to get across in my talk is even though these models look very different and have very different terminology, there's really a few basic principles guiding them. And one of them is find a latent variable that if you know the value of the latent variable, everything becomes conditionally independent, which, which makes your likelihood and, and or objective function uh, much more simple to work with. Um, so the representational form of these models is often very, very simple. Um, learning the, the, the models can, can be more complicated, and, and there's been a fair bit of progress on that in the last few years. It's also interesting to think when we use latent variable or hidden variable models, what is the purpose? What is our interpretation of the latent variables? And there are situations, computer vision would be a good example, where the latent variables are, represent something we could actually measure if we had access to the scene that the camera, uh, where the camera was positioned. How far away is the object? How many objects were there? There is an actual true answer to the, to the question if we just could go back and had enough data to measure it. But in many cases, things are not measurable. And um, in, the, in that situation, it may be that we're using our latent variable modeling as a black box. Uh, for example, principal component analysis or hidden Markov models might be a, examples there. And then in other situations, the latent variables are not measurable, but we don't, uh, uh, we do want to interpret what they are. We're, we're looking for some insight into the data. And, and scientists like this. If you work with scientists, biologists, or even historians, for example, they, they, they love having tools that can suggest theories that, that might be in the data. In fact, uh, those of you that have worked with scientists will, will find that they're very uh, willing to, to adopt uh, latent variable models like principal components and give them physical interpretations that might not be really justified, but that's uh, something you have to be aware, aware of. Um, and, and doing this in a statistical framework, um, at least I find, is, is, is very useful. Um, there are many of the problems I'll talk about, there are, you can approach them in a statistical probabilistic way, or you can use a more optimization, you know, maybe a clustering algorithm that doesn't really have any probabilistic semantics. Um, I find that the, the probabilistic statistical approach very useful. Uh, there's a rich literature you can build on, M many ideas, many of these ideas going back a long way uh, before people had the computational tools to use them. And you have, a, you have a foundation, particularly when you start putting in things like time into, the, into these models. You have all of the techniques from time series, from Markov modeling, stochastic processes that you can leverage and take advantage of. So it gives you a great starting point. And of course, if you're trying to estimate parameters, then you have that machinery as well. But it is important, and I, I think we sometimes get carried away, that all of this comes with uh, a cost. So if uh, person A comes along with k-means and they can take a data set and analyze it and be done and go home and eat their dinner and it's all nice, the business person or the scientist is nice and happy, versus perhaps uh, somebody comes along with a very complicated Dirichlet process thing and it requires six PhD students to go with the algorithm to make it work, well, you know, we need to keep that in mind. So, so there is a, a kind of a cautionary note that um, 
the complexity of some of these models can they can get quite complicated, and uh, simpler models sometimes are, are 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 better. Okay, so all of that was by way of introduction. Uh, what I'm going to talk about is essentially in two parts. Uh, the first part will be about text and particularly about topic models. Uh, I'll review basic concepts, and I, I, I'm thinking most people in the audience are familiar with this, but I want to make sure everybody is on the same page, so we'll go over some of the basic concepts. And then I'll talk about some newer results that you might not be familiar with uh, in semi-supervised learning with, with topic models that I think are quite interesting. I'll, I'll then switch over to looking at network data, but hopefully in a, in a way where you'll see the connections, that, that the models for network data are not so different from the types of things I talked about for text. And we'll talk, uh, time permitting, about both static networks and an area where I think there's a, a lot more interesting things to be done, which is dynamic networks, where you observe a network over time. And then we'll finish up. Okay, so let's start to talk about text and just some very, very simple concepts here. Um, we'll talk a lot about multinomial distributions and just what is a multinomial? Well, let's, this is a particular example here. This was, in fact, learned from a data set where we have uh, the most likely words. Now keep in mind here, this is just the top 10 or so words for this multinomial. They each have a probability. The probability is sum to one. And the, the number of words might be in the tens of thousands. So we're just looking at a few words here that have most of the probability mass. Uh, the words at the bottom of the list, if we went way down on the ground, would have 10 to the minus five or 10 to the minus, you know, would have very little probability. So this is a distribution that's very heavily skewed towards certain words. And the way we use it in our models is think of it as a, as a die. So a die has six sides, uh, we, each is equally likely. This particular die will have maybe 50,000 sides. It'll have a side for each word, and it's not in each of the, of the sides is not equally likely. Uh, they're going to be uh, skewed in this manner. So the word president is much more likely than some of the other words. Okay, so when we talk about multinomials, that's what we'll be talking about. Um, this is the way this is used. It has, it, it's, there's a conditional independence assumption that, uh, like just like in a die or a coin, when we use the model, the next word doesn't depend on the last word. It only depends on the parameters. And so that's what this picture is telling us, this graphical model saying we have the word probabilities, which sum to one, a vector of them, and each different word, the first word, second word, third word, only depends on the model parameters, not on the, the last word. Now, they're obvious, this is the bag of words assumption. And so we're, we're not looking at the sequence of words in the text, we're just looking at the counts, essentially. And for simplicity, we'll uh, use plate diagrams so we don't have to keep rewriting these things. And if you haven't seen plate diagrams, it just means that this is replicated n times uh, given the parent here. So it's the same as the previous picture. Uh, and we have n replications. Now, to do some, anything interesting, we, we don't want to have a single multinomial. We, we want, we'd like to have multiple multinomials. Just having one multinomial for language would not be that interesting. And so here we have two, um, and these, these are going to be our topics. So when you hear about topic models, the topics themselves are multinomial distributions over words. And this is the one we had before, and over here we have a completely different set of uh, high probability words, and these are all about colors. Uh, and this, in fact, was a, a topic that was learned from uh, some educational uh, text, and so a very different focus, a different, very different set of words, but these other words would appear somewhere on the list with very low probability, but they're very different probability distributions. So to represent that in our graphical model, this is the same picture we had before, but we've added a little bit. We have an indicator variable now, that can take, say, k values. k is our number of uh, topics that we're going to have here. It might be 100, 200, something like that. And, oh, well, okay, so it's called, uh, instead of k, it's t. And over here now we need t different distributions. And so we have a plate representing the t distributions. And so basically this is just going to switch. If, if z is equal to 7, then we look up the seventh uh, multinomial over here. So this is a nice notation for these kinds of models. Uh, we can use this to do clustering. Uh, we just sort of keep building up the picture here. And um, we've added a, another plate here now for D documents. So words are conditionally independent inside of a document. There's a Z variable associated with each document. So that's the class label or cluster label for that document. Each has its own associated with one of these distributions over here. And then because we have a plate here, uh, these documents are assumed to be independent of each other. And they depend on disease depend on some overall mixture weights. So this would have been the story probably about 10 or 15 years ago in terms of probabilistic clustering of, of documents. And pr pretty much anybody who used this model realized that, yeah, it's okay, but documents often have multiple themes in them, multiple topics. And so a very simple change representationally, which we've done here, is to move the z variable into the word level. 
So previously it was out here at the document level. All we've done here is we've moved it inside and we've also moved the mixture weights inside this plate. So now each document has a distribution over topics and now each uh, Z variable, each word is, can be coming from a different topic if we want. So we might have a document that's focused on topics one and seven with probabilities 0.5 and then we'll sample words from those two topics uh, given, given the Z's. So very, very simple but actually quite powerful. And it's sort of interesting that people knew about this model, um, you know, up prior to 2000 but we didn't really have good ways to estimate it. It, it, it wasn't that easy to estimate the model. So just to, to clarify, uh, you know, an example of how this works, here's a paper uh, from uh, Pierre Baldi and colleagues that was at NIPS uh, many years ago, maybe in 94 or so. And it's interesting because it's, it really is bridging two different fields. It's taking hidden Markov models and using them for sequence analysis and bioinformatics. Now today that's very standard, but at the time this was really uh, combining two things that were very different to each other. And if you use clustering, we just ran this through k-means. We get a cluster, these are the sort of the important words in the cluster that are, well, they're kind of a mixture of different words about neural networks and hidden Markov and so forth. It's not particularly good representation. If we use topics, it's assigned to these two different topics, and so we get a much nicer representation of the document. And again, many of you have used topic models, you're aware of this, but I just want to bring everybody uh, sort of up to speed on this. Um, all right, so this is the equation uh, that's representing things. So the probability of a word on the left here uh, is represented by uh, the probability of the different, under the different uh, topics, we sum out over the, the topic variable z here, and uh, we have the probability of the different topics occurring in that document. Uh, fairly simple, but we still haven't said how we're going to learn this from data. We can also think of this as a, as a matrix decomposition or matrix uh, factorization, which can have its advantages. And um, it's, it's similar to PCA or SVD, but a little bit different in that the matrix on the left is uh, the probabilities of words given the document. So each row will be a probability of a word given that document. Um, rather than the uh, actual counts themselves. And on the right we have uh, two sort of skinny matrices where our, if you like, dimension reduction is happening with the uh, topics here. So the first one is the coefficients, if you like, for each document. And the second one, uh, each uh, row here is a given topic and then it's the multinomial that has the different probabilities of the different words. And so if we sort of look at how this works with the equation, the probability of a particular word in a particular document is basically the dot product of the uh, coefficients for that document across topics and then the probabilities of words given, particular word given those different topics, so a column from the, from the second matrix. So there's a very nice uh, analogy here with, with things that we do in other contexts such as principal components and so forth. And indeed, uh, if you look at the history of this model, uh, people had used the idea of matrix decomposition for text uh, as LSA. Um, and the problem with that was that we're, we're modeling counts and uh, LSA is based on principal components, SPD, which is really suited for real valued uh, data. Uh, so Thomas Hoffman was really the person who brought topic modeling to the fore with his papers uh, back in uh, the late 1990s. Uh, the idea had been circulating around in image analysis, say at NIPS and other places, and also was present in, in some statistics papers, uh, but people really hadn't figured out how to fit this model. So in image analysis, for example, the idea that uh, an object is composed of multiple parts is very appealing, and so people had been thinking a lot about that kind of a model, these kind of factor models. Uh, Thomas applied it to, to text and uh, I think immediately a lot of people said this is interesting, this is, this is taking us beyond clustering. Um, it, it's also interesting sort of historically, the, the, the paper to get most of the attention is the David Bly paper, which is a, a great paper, um, and that came along later, but it was really building very strongly on Thomas's, Thomas's work. And then you had the Gibbs sampling extension which allowed people to easily estimate these models, and then many, many, many extensions and applications since then. So we haven't yet said anything about how we learn this model, and again, there are many people in the audience who know a lot about this, so, but some may not. Um, so what do we actually need to learn? So this is back to our uh, graphical model, and we have, we have these distributions of words uh, given the topics. Um, we have, what else do we have? We have the mixtures for each document 
uh, of the topics for that particular document. And we have these latent variables, these Zs. Every single word has, has a Z attached to it. So in, in theory, if you didn't know anything about learning on supervised learning, you'd say this maybe is a little bit uh, unconstrained. Uh, but the structure of text, uh, actually one of the things, as you know, if you work with these models, is that you, you, it, it, it works quite remarkably well. Uh, so one of the ways to think about how the learning algorithm, the, especially the Gibbs sampling learning algorithms, is pretend if we knew the Zs. If we did know the Zs, what would we be able to do? Well, th the problem simplifies straight away. So I've colored in green uh, as if the Zs were known. Now I know each Z, the, the topic of every word in every document. So estimating the topic distributions, the topic mixtures for any document is trivial. I just count up. And similarly, I know across the corpus for every word, uh, what, what it's assigned to, so I can easily figure out, uh, just again by counting, uh, for a given topic, what its distribution over words is. So uh, getting at the Z's gives us an easy way to get theta and phi, the, the other parameters, and that's, that's how the Gibbs sampling learning algorithm works, essentially. Um, so we have our bag of words input, we have the number of topics, we have uh, no labels, the collapse Gibbs sampling basically, uh, a technical trick in uh, uh, sampling techniques to integrate out theta and phi and just figure out if I just wanted to know the z's, what would I do if, if, and, and from a Bayesian point of view? And you get a very simple update equation. That update equation has to be executed on every word in every document, uh, maybe hundreds or thousands of times. You do this kind of collapse cube sampling, uh, but it's linear in the number of word tokens and in T. And uh, then once you have samples of Zs, you can get uh, point estimates of theta and phi. So that's basically the Gibbs sampling. It, in, in MATLAB, you can write it in a few lines, which has been part of the appeal of topic models is that it's very easy to use. Um, outputs then are the topic word probability distributions, the document topic probability distributions. And if you want to look at the individual Zs, you have them. Uh, they tend to be quite noisy, but you can average over them, get sentence level, word level, section level, et cetera. I should also say there are other learning algorithms, uh, variational EM, other techniques, but the collapse give sampling is so easy that people have uh, uh, used it. Um, so I think topic modeling is at a point where uh, really it needs to find applications. Uh, there are so many papers being published on topic modeling, including my own group, uh, but it's at a point now where we really need to start saying, how can we use this to help people solve problems? One of the projects in my group right now is uh, funded by the US government is we're looking at large amounts of historical scientific literature to try to track the emergence of ideas. Um, and we're working with people who study the history of science and technology is quite interesting. So um, as an example, um, we have 49,000 abstracts that are related to the area of DNA microarrays. And um, we're interested in trying to f figure out when did, the new, when did new ideas, how did this area of DNA microarrays in, in biology, how, how did it emerge? Uh, what was the process that happened? And so if you run the topic model, you get uh, you know, the usual set of different uh, types of um, topics. Uh, ranging, and I've ordered them here, just picked five, and these are the top five words in each, each topic, the highest probability, from sort of very basic technology to things that are more application oriented. So at the beginning, you have topics like uh, just the basic technology of the microarray chips. Uh, then you have the emergence of topics that are more, how do you use the data coming off the chips, where computer scientists start to get involved, and then, over here, you have biologists starting to use, actually use the data and, and clinicians to solve real problems. Um, and so what's nice is if you look uh, at, at, at this in, through the lens of the topic model, uh, let me explain how this graph works. So this is time going this direction, and this is the fraction of words per year assigned to a particular topic. There were 100 topics in the model, so if everything was equally likely, and we took all the documents from say the year 2000, then everything would be here. What we're showing here are four topics that are overrepresented in that year. Uh, in fact, they account, these four account for nearly 50% of all the words. And these topics, I don't know if you can read it, but they're uh, very technology device physics oriented. They're, the papers that were being published at that time were very focused on just how do you build these gadgets and, and get them to work. And then what's interesting is over time, the prevalence of these went down, and since these are fractions, something else must be going up, and you see um, patients and uh, treatment, classification, pathways and networks, stem cells, 
you know, much more biological, clinical application types of topics emerging. And there's quite a, quite a pronounced uh, uh, change here. And so the people we're collaborating with are very interested in, in can you quantify uh, you know, the papers that they tend to write in the history of science and technology are somewhat hand wavy, they do some keyword searches, and this potentially gives them much more powerful tools to try to quantify what was going on. And so the funding agencies, for example, are, are very interested in this type of analysis. Uh, there are limits, of course, to what you can do, but uh, it gives them something uh, more quantitative where they can look at funding programs and see wh what was happening. So we're also looking at patents here and so forth. Um, coming back to the historical example, the Pennsylvania Gazette uh, data, um, this is uh, from a colleague of mine, Dave Newman, uh, where again, the types, th this particular topic uh, that they, they, they found in, in the data is about constitutional law. And of course, you know, it's, it's, it's nice that in 1776 this starts to, to increase and um, the, uh, you, you can see how historians would, would be interested in, in using this as a new tool and are using it as, as a new tool in, in analyzing this kind of data. I should also say that the, the, the examples I'm showing here, the model knows nothing about time. This is very naive, very simple, where we're just fitting a model to all of the data and then retrospectively binning the data by year and counting. Um, a more sophisticated approach here, and there are many such algorithms, would be to put time into the model, uh, but they tend to be a little bit uh, trickier to, to get to work. Uh, there's, there's a variety of such techniques out there. Um, let me show you another example. This is the Enron email data set. And uh, for any young people interested in, in going out and making a lot of money, uh, let me suggest a good startup would be uh, use some kind of text analysis techniques and, and sell them to lawyers, to legal companies. So if you go to work for any law firm, uh, say as a consultant, you'll find that they're still buried in paper and PDF files and they use keyword search and really could use a lot of help. And so the, the reason I'm mentioning this is because the Enron email data set became available um, through uh, the legal uh, action of the US government who prosecuted them uh, uh, several years ago. And um, 250,000 emails were subpoenaed and arrived at the US Justice Department's desk. And you can imagine being a lawyer, working, say a junior lawyer in the office, you come in on Monday morning, your boss says, great, we just got all the emails from Enron, or at least some of the emails from Enron. And uh, you're, you're thrilled, that's great. And then the, your boss says, and we're in court on Wednesday, and I need you to find the, uh, you know, the, the 100 emails that are most relevant and, and use them in court. And so if you had to use keyword search, searching through all these emails, uh, it, it would be very difficult. So again, techniques, clustering, topic modeling, and so forth, I think have a lot of potential there. But they, we can't just sort of throw them over the fence to, uh, people in law or in history, that we, we need to work with them, collaborate with them to, to build useful tools. Um, so the types of topics that you will get if you run on uh, Enron email are things like, sorry, come back here, um, standard sort of things about constructing, you know, construction, uh, the environmental uh, issues about air quality. These are the types of topics you might expect. Uh, Enron was a, a large energy company, and so these are typical of what we might expect. Maybe what we wouldn't expect, but in hindsight uh, is obvious would be there, are these personal topics. Uh, so holiday parties, uh, Enron is in Texas and they like their football, American football, so they bet a lot on these. There was a whole topic about that. There was a Christian topic, there was one about online shopping. So again, if you're the lawyer, you might say, okay, I, I'm not interested in any of this stuff. This is just uh, not relevant. And then you do find sort of political topics. Uh, there was a big issue about yeah, power in California, uh, and in particular a bankruptcy uh, aspect of that. Also, there's an interesting topic about lobbying in Washington, uh, some, a topic about uh, lawsuits. And what's nice is you can go in and, and say, I, where are the emails that go with these particular topics? And there's actually some very interesting emails in that data set uh, if you have time uh, to go and look at it. Okay, so um, many of you have seen much of this before, and, and so from here on, hopefully some of this will be newer. Uh, there are many, many extensions that people have come up with, some, some people probably in this room, uh, and I can't mention everybody's name, but some of the highlights would be you know, putting time into the model so you can properly take time into account, uh, putting correlation into it, non-parametric techniques so we don't fix the number of topics ahead of time, uh, author topic models, and, and an idea that uh, my group has, picked up on and I think is very useful and maybe underappreciated is this Dirichlet multinomial regression 
idea from David Mimno uh, and Andrew McCallum, where you can pretty much add in arbitrary metadata into the model uh, using a, sort of a general regression framework, and, and that seems quite nice. It sort of subsumes many, much of the earlier work, like uh, alter topics and so forth. Okay, so let me, let me move on to some work that maybe is less familiar to you, and uh, let me motivate this by saying, you know, one of the nice things about topic models and clustering techniques is you just throw data at it, you don't need any prior knowledge, uh, it's just purely data driven, and, and that's great. But when you start to work with people in applications, you realize there is in fact often a lot of prior knowledge available that you might want to use. In particular, dealing with text, um, in some sense it seems almost silly, you know, your four year old would say, you know, daddy, why are you trying to learn all this just from uh, data when, when there's a lot of information out there already that's structured. So let me expand a little bit on what I mean. Um, the first example I'm going to talk about is, is label data, uh, which, you know, for text documents is often small, but still very, very useful. So if we look at the problem for a few minutes of, of multi-label uh, classification for documents, and here are uh, three data sets that are fairly widely used in the literature, uh, but they're actually relatively small, particularly in terms of the number of unique labels that are in the data sets. So this is the Reuters data set, about 100 labels, and the Yahoo Arts and Health data sets, which each have order of 20 labels. And the median number of documents per individual label, so every label is associated with a certain number of documents, is quite high, hundreds or thousands. And so discriminative methods tend to work fine here, you know, SVMs, one versus all, and so forth. If you start to look at, you know, real world data sets, um, and let's look at two examples here. Uh, this is the Eurolex data set, a European legal uh, document set that has labels uh, that has come out in the last few years. And this is the New York Times annotated data set, a very nice data set with very rich annotations uh, that's also been made available the last few years. It, it, the numbers are almost reversed. Now you have thousands of unique labels. In fact, both of these data sets are really the pub, some of the publicly available versions that were used in experiments. There's really uh, orders of magnitude more labels that you could be using. and the median number of documents per label is now much smaller. Uh, in, it, it's, it's just, you know, order of, you know, 10 or, or 1 even. In fact, if we look at this graph here for these two corpora, uh, this is where we sort the labels by how many documents are associated with each one. So if, if you have a dot over here, it means this is a label. We have one label with 10 to the 3 documents associated with it. Over here, we have, um, label that has uh, one document associated with it, and there's over 10 to the 3 such labels. Um, so, and you see this sort of dramatic power law type uh, uh, picture or distribution uh, for both of these data sets. In other words, there's many more labels down here. There's a huge number of labels that have only a single document in the corpus associated with them. And then a smaller number that have two documents and a smaller number that have three. Uh, but it's very skewed towards the left. So most of your labels have almost no data. And so discriminative methods are going to have a problem uh, if there's only one, uh, say, training document, uh, one positive example. So this idea has been picked up on uh, by our group and others. Um, a very, very simple idea. Uh, so we take topic modeling and we associate each uh, label with a topic. Um, and during learning, during that Gibbs sampling, where if you remember, the learning algorithm is going through, and for every word token, it's saying, okay, which, uh, given everything else I know, which label should it be assigned to, which topic should it be assigned to. So instead of looking at all the possible topics or all the possible labels here, you just restrict it to the uh, assigned labels for that uh, particular document. So instead of a thousand possible labels, you say, no, a human said there's, this document is about these three labels, so I just sample from those. Uh, so what in, in effect the, the topic model does here is it learns to associate the labels in the, the multi-label document set with which words within documents go with it. It comes up with probability distributions. And in fact, it's, it's nice because it's much faster than the typical topic model, which has to consider all of the possible topics. Now it's, it's being told to focus in on a few. And the key difference with the discriminative method here is that it's, you're, you're, you're doing the labeling at the word level, not at, not at the document level. Um, and we'll see that that gives you some advantages with these uh, uh, very uh, large label sets in, in a few minutes. The other thing that's useful here is uh, to build in label dependencies. If you work with multi-label document classification, you know 
that it's, it's, a, it's a difficult problem to figure out uh, how to build in dependencies between labels. And in the probabilistic framework, at least, we have ways to do that in a fairly straightforward manner. And it does improve performance significantly. So let me just give you an example of how this works in practice. Here's an article from the New York Times, at least the first few lines of it. Um, and it has three labels attached to it. Uh, it's, a, it's, a, it's an article about lawsuits and video games. Uh, so maybe a patent lawsuit or, or antitrust, I guess, in this case. And this is how many other, well, how many documents in total have these labels? So the first two have, you know, or 19 and 67, but the, the video games label itself, this is the only document it appears in. So um, what you imagine might happen is that a discriminative classifier here is going to have trouble uh, figuring out what words go with video games, just given that it has one label and has two other labels attached to this document as well. Um, and sure enough, when we look at the SVM and look at the, uh, the words that appear to be relevant, there's some words associated with video games, Nint Nintendo, but then there's a lot of other somewhat random words here. And LDA is able to pick out essentially the right words here and it's, it's the idea, you know, that in, in Uta Pearl's book, if you remember, if you've looked at it, explaining away. Uh, the other words have been, the non-video game words have already been explained away by the models for antitrust actions and suits and litigation. And uh, the remaining words are the ones that are picked up here by, by LDA. So it works out quite nicely. Um, and indeed, when we look at, the, if you remember, we had three data sets. And uh, these are the three where there's a lot of data for a small number of labels. And these are the ones where there's a very large number of labels and on average very few documents per, per label. And this is how much better LDA is doing versus SVMs. And these SVMs were tuned to be as best as possible. Um, they're not sort of, we, we try to be absolutely as fair as we could here. And you, there's definitely a significant difference. Um, and these guys are doing, the LDA is doing well here precisely because of the example on the previous slide. It can, pick up on these documents uh, or labels where there are very few documents. When you start to get over to the, the, the data set Reuters that had a lot of documents per individual label, you, or the SVMs start to pick up an advantage because they're discriminative. Another way to look at this is we, in this paper, which uh, came out fairly recently, we, we measured a lot of different metrics. Uh, there's a number, if you're doing multi-label document classification, there are quite a few different metrics people use, so we, we looked at pretty much all of them. And at one end, uh, SVMs were doing clearly better, 24 out of 25 uh, SVMs are doing better. At the other end, it was the opposite. Uh, so we definitely saw this difference. And I think the way to go here, obviously, is some kind of uh, hybrid uh, generative discriminative model that combines both. I'm trying to get one of my students to write a paper on that. He hasn't, so it's, it's, it's sitting out there available for somebody to do something interesting in that context. All right, let me uh, uh, give you a second example of using uh, supervised uh, information in a, in a potentially interesting way. Um, so here's a topic that was learned from a corpus, and if we look at the high probability words, we say, okay, this is probably about families, family life, uh, child, father, etc. Now, what's interesting is um, if you go to a thesaurus, you can also get a definition of a family, and these are the words in blue, um, and it's, it's a different sort of a representation of the concept of family. It has a lot of words that we don't see very commonly in English. Uh, birthright, brood, uh, heirloom, etc., dynastic, and, and so forth. Uh, but it doesn't have any notion of, of a distribution, how often these words are used. So both sort of sources of information here are potentially useful going forward. If, if the topic model could know about these other words, it could generalize better to new, new data sets and perhaps learn better if it, knew, it used them as prior knowledge. And you can also imagine that if I were somehow able to put probabilities on these words, sort of fit the thesaurus information to data, I could then look at how well does a thesaurus match a particular data set or map documents into the thesaurus. And it turns out you can do this very simply. It's, it, it, it's, not, it's a fairly straightforward thing to do, and some work in the last few years we've done it. So you just treat the thesaurus as, as prior knowledge and associate each concept in the thesaurus uh, as a, a topic in, in your topic model. And so now the words associated with the thesaurus concept act essentially as a prior for the topic. And there's a different ways you can do that. You know, one of the questions, of course, is how strong should that prior be? And I'm not going to get into that story, but um, you can basically do different types of things to figure that out. Um, from the topic learning point of view, um, 
you've got this great starting point, uh, you know, about what concepts may, you may be looking for. So you can also learn, you know, you can have free topics that are not associated with the concepts in the thesaurus and see what that picks up as well. And then from the thesaurus' point of view, you're essentially overlaying a probabilistic model on top of something that was up to that point essentially a, more of a logical type of representation. Um, so here's an example um, using uh, the science part of a, a, a large concept set. And, and there may be, you know, tens of thousands of these concepts in some of these thesauri. Um, and so we've learned which the probabilities of words in terms of how they're associated with concepts. Uh, these are the concepts appearing in a particular document. And then you can go into the document and here they're color coded with uh, which words go now with, and these are not just arbitrary topics, these are, these are concepts that are from a particular thesaurus that knows about science. And so words like charged and so forth get picked up here as it being associated with physics in, in, the, in the right context rather than, uh, you know, some other particular concept. You can do things like map documents into the thesaurus. So a lot of these thesauri or, or uh, knowledge representation techniques will have uh, hierarchies. And um, so we've done some work where uh, you, again, are each of these nodes here is a concept and a set of words are associated with it. We fit that to a data set and then we get to sort of probabilistic representation of this and then we can take new text and figure out where it fits. And this is just showing, this would be a huge tree, but it's just showing this particular article is about neonatal development and breathing and the lungs and so forth. So again, you might not be able to see that, but it's picked out a chemistry node, it's picked out, I can hardly see this myself, uh, pregnancy and birth and breathing. So it's, it's, it's sort of focused in, in the thesaurus, uh, what's relevant. Um, from, from the text itself. And I, I think there's a lot more that could be done here, actually. This was just some work that we did. And if you're into prediction, uh, I said earlier that in principle that, that we should get better quality topics out by initializing it with the, uh, these concepts. And this is an experiment showing the log probability of new documents, where here we just learned topics without any, any thesaurus. In the, the dotted one, we added this uh, Cambridge International Dictionary Thesaurus, and this is uh, the Open Directory project where we just took um, the words on the web pages associated with particular concepts, and because our, uh, we were tr looking at scientific data here, this did the best. It, it really uh, it did very well, and uh, the topic model itself started to overfit after a while. Okay, so this is just a picture from Wikipedia. I think there's a you know, ton of information out there that's very noisy. I mean, the, if you look at Wikipedia categories and Wikipedia pages, there is a lot of uh, skew and noise there, but I think there's a lot more we, that could be done with combining these types of models. All right, so now into the second part of the talk. Let's see how we're doing on time, or what's the, uh, we've got about uh, 15 minutes, maybe? 15, okay, all right, good. Um, and so I'm going to shift gears, uh, but hopefully I will be able to persuade you that the techniques and ideas are really not radically different from what we've been talking about. Um, that in fact, they're very similar in many respects. Um, so we need a little bit of notation. Uh, so we'll start off by talking about, and I'm really going to be talking mostly about social networks, although in some of my examples, documents will be the nodes, but I'm thinking more about social networks. So the notation will, will, will reflect that. So we have N, in, in the social network world, you call them actors, this is the node set. And we'll assume that um, even if we're looking at things over time, that we magically know the set of actors and the, the a priori and, and, and that is fixed. And it's an interesting problem in a real world problem of as actors come and go. So people who attend the ECML PKDD conference from year to year, that's not a static set, but we'll ignore that problem as, as everybody else, most other people do. Um, the edges between the actors we'll think of initially at least in the static case as an adjacency matrix Y, uh, an N by N matrix. So Y subscript IJ, which you'll see in some of the upcoming uh, slides, indicates an edge between actor I and actor J. And in the simplest case, you could think of that as being binary, uh, undirected. Uh, maybe it's directed. In a more complicated case, it might be a count. Um, and we'll also talk about covariates and attributes. And again, this is very, prevalent in, in real world data. You just don't have the network you have, for example, for each individual. You might have the age of the person. If you're a company gathering data about your customers, uh, if you're a scientist looking at the scientific literature, you might have uh, co-author relations and you have the text documents that people wrote. Uh, and also on edges, the edges themselves may have attributes. Uh, they could have text associated with them if we're looking at email, for example. 
So an example of uh, exactly that, this is from Hewlett Packard Labs, data collected over six months, and we see some so an interesting structure here of sort of core, dense cores and people on the periphery. And uh, again, there's a lot of additional information here about uh, how many emails were sent, when were they sent, that we can sort of ignore and, and just collapse this into an aggregate graph for the, for the moment at least. Another way to look at this type of data, um, here is a matrix of senders and receivers, a large uh, uh, study that was done, 3,000 people over three months, and there's a, a dot with depending on how big the, uh, how many emails were sent. And you can see some of the senders sent, you know, this is probably somebody broadcasting some, maybe some kind of spam account or conference announcement or seminar announcement account. This was at a particular campus. Uh, and there's a lot of potential structure in, in this data. So modeling the, the, you know, there's a long history in social network analysis um, of trying to model these kinds of data sets. This is not something that computer scientists, machine learning, data mining people have uh, come around to. Um, and um, latent variable models turned out to be very useful in this context. Uh, if you, th there is a rich history of looking at what are called exponential random graph models, uh, but they're really hard to work with. Um, if you think of, you know a little bit about Markov random fields, imagine a much harder version of Markov random fields, where the normalization constant is even, even like exponentially harder than that to, to, to estimate. And so, even though exponential random graph models are, are very nice in some sense a canonical model for, for social network data, they don't scale well, and they have a fair number of issues. And that might change, but that's the state of the world as we have it. So latent variable models, again, like in the text data, where we were assuming conditional independence of the words given the, the Z variables and conditional independence of the Zs given the document mixtures, here we're going to choose some kind of latent variable, I haven't told you what yet, so that the edges are conditionally independent given the latent variables. So if I somehow magically can find the latent variables, then it will simplify the rest of my model. So that's going to be the, the, the aim of the game here. And we'll get to examples in a minute. In fact, first example is um, let's embed the nodes in a k-dimensional real-valued uh, space. So every node will be represented by a k-dimensional vector of, of real numbers. And the probability of an edge between any pair will be proportional to how, or a function of how close they are together. So if you think in two dimensions, we're, we're essentially trying to find an embedding in a two-dimensional plane, and then from that point on, once we know where each node is located, the probabilities of edges just are a function of the distance between nodes, and it, it's, it's a very simple model for saying what's the probability of edges. Uh, the trick is to find the embedding. So uh, the, the details of this, this was proposed in uh, about 10 years ago, um, is if we look at the log odds, uh, which is the probability of that there's an edge divided by one minus the probability of an edge, we can write this in this uh, sort of additive form here. Um, this is the distance between nodes i and j, that, and zi is the latent position of uh, 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 node i and zga, the late position node j. This is some overall network density parameter, so we can put in a parameter that says, yeah, on average we expect, uh, even if I know nothing else, any random pair of nodes, there, there's a probability of an edge between them. So that, that's nice. And we can also put in, and this is sort of a, something you see in the statistical literature a lot, is uh, sort of try, trying to set things up as a regression problem, in a regression framework. So you can add in other things you know. And here in this model they put in uh, these are coefficients that we learn, and this is a vector for every pair of attributes. So pairwise attributes, it might be, uh, are they the, the two actors the same gender? Uh, are they the same age? Things like that, or how different in age are they? And then you can try to learn, here you'd be learning, well, the network density parameter, but the, how important or how relevant are these various attributes, and then the embeddings as well, the Zs. Um, and so basically they just set this up, write down the likelihood for this, and say, okay, off we go, optimize, and the thing works quite nicely. So this is the likelihood function. So given the Zs, uh, you have a very simple form. It's, it's all the pairs are conditionally independent if you know where the Zs are. And so you go ahead, and this is a, you know, a, a latent variable optimization problem. You can do, you can do gradient descent directly if you want. They did this in the first paper. In the later paper, they became more Bayesian and did it with priors and so forth. There is one thing that they didn't mention or didn't really pay much attention to in the paper. This product is over all pairs, not just where the edges are, but all non-edges as well. And this comes up when you start to look at these uh, models uh, for if you want to scale them up. And 
there are ways to get around this. One sort of obvious idea that, that has been developed is you break this into a product of uh, terms of the actual edges, which is usually fairly small, and then the many, many, many pairs where there are no edges. And uh, that second term of the no edges, you can approximate that by some kind of sampling. You don't actually have to look at every non-edge. And so that idea, you can formalize that and it works, it works quite well. But if you don't do that, you're looking at order n squared. And if you're Facebook, you're dead in the water. Or if you're not even Facebook, smaller, like even a thousand nodes, you're pretty much, in, it's gonna be very slow. So this is the kind of thing that they get. And in fact, if you know multidimensional scaling where you embed nodes, you know, in, in say in two dimensions, this is very similar, but in a probabilistic statistical framework. So we can add in things like covariates in a, in a, in a principled way. Um, now here's a model that harkens back to what I talked earlier and looks very different. In fact, you say, well, wait a minute, this is not, a network model, I mean, how does this relate to our latent embedding ideas? But I'm gonna show you that this is in fact very similar to the model we just talked about. Um, so this is uh, Chang and Bly a few years ago. So it's a topic model, this is the graphical model, much the same as what we were talking about earlier, um, where they've added in relations between the documents, so maybe citations or co-author relations. And so these new variables here, these y's, the same y's we were just talking about, are one or zero, and they're one if an edge exists, and zero if an edge doesn't exist. And they're influenced by the topics of the pair of uh, documents, in this case, that we're thinking of connecting. And so if documents are more similar, there's this, the probability here goes up, and um, one of the nice things about this model, it's a, it's a, it's a nicely written paper, you, the, the topics influence the links. If you don't know where the links are, the topics can tell you about where the links might be, and the other direction as well. The links influence the topics, so if two documents are linked, their topics are more likely to be similar. And they show experimentally, they get some nice results here. Um, so I'm running through here some different examples, and where I'm headed is to show you that, in fact, you can look at them all in the same way. And another idea in terms of latent variable modeling is to basically do clustering, uh, but with some probabilities attached to it. And this is called stochastic block modeling in the social network analysis literature. So we partition our nodes into K blocks or groups that are what are considered structurally equivalent in the sense that they, they act the same in the network. And so P of YIJ now is replaced by subscripts Ki and Kj, you just inherit the probabilities of your group. So you're not an individual anymore if you're in the professor group. Uh, your probability of uh, having an edge to a student is just generic for professors to students, not you to the individual student. And so you reduce the number of parameters hugely down to K by K, and there's nice interpretations as well of learning roles and so forth. And here's a picture that shows something about that. So you have two levels of parameters. You have this K by K matrix of pairwise probabilities between the groups, which if k is small enough is not too hard to estimate, and then you need the indicator variables telling you which group each uh, node is in. And you can, you can use your favorite estimation technique, and there's all kinds of extensions of this. Um, one that maybe I don't mention is, what is important is this mixed membership stochastic block model, where they generalize this idea to say instead of, you know, instead of a clustering type approach where you're in one group and that's it, that's your role uh, in totality, let's think of an LDA-like way of looking at this and say, no, you have a distribution over groups. So um, you, there's a probability distribution now over the K groups and uh, that gives us a bit more flexibility, particularly in, in data sets where there's time involved, where people may play different roles. So they, uh, today they're a professor, but at the weekend they're a fisherman, and so the, the ties can, uh, can be inherited from different uh, groups and so forth. Okay, so a unified view of all of this um, is, is possible, and this uh, is not my idea, but Peter Hof and, and other people have uh, shown that um, Basically, you can write down the probability of, an, of a particular edge as some function, maybe it's a logistic function, really this f function here is just playing the role of getting us to a zero, one scale, so it's just some kind of, what statisticians call a link function, uh, of some distance, the g is going to be some way of uh, basically comparing zi and zj. So zi and zj are gonna be our latent vectors representing where individual i and individual j are. This is, these are our covariates over here, and this is our density parameter. So we've seen examples like this. So as I said, this is the combining function. These are the latent vectors, and then the other guys here are covariates. Now, where did all the models I've told you about differ is basically in how they pick this g function and what the z's represent, how they represent the z variables. Um, 
And of course, the likelihood is quite simple here. It's just, you know, to get the probability of all of the data, I just take the product of all of these guys conditioned on knowing the Zs and the betas. Um, so the first example, the G function, if we just put in the G function as being the uh, distance between the, in the Euclidean space, the k-dimensional space, I get that general equation up above. Uh, the others are maybe not quite so obvious. Peter Hoff is a nice example. Instead of an additive representation, you can think of a multiplicative type of representation where maybe the fact that people are similar means that they're less likely to have uh, connections. Th this would be relationships like husband and wife or that, those kinds of partnership types of things. And so he allows a, kind of a, a multiplicative relationship which is modulated by this W matrix here. And, and he has nice examples of where that can be a better model. Um, the relational topic model, I promised you I'd show you that that's very similar. Well, disease are the topics uh, of the two nodes, if you like, and um, you can take, you know, element-wise product uh, of, of the two topic distributions and you get basically uh, this representation here. And you can go through, you know, the, the stochastic block model. We have the G function is now basically an indicator telling us which uh, of the uh, elements of the K by K matrix we should select. Um, the mixed membership model can be written the same way. There's a binary feature model which is very similar to uh, Hope's multiplicative model except the Z's are restricted now to be binary and the W doesn't have to be diagonal. And so in some sense, um, you know, when you put up these slides and show that all these models can be written in the form of a more general equation, you can say, well, we don't need to write any more papers on this stuff. It's, it's all done. We just need to know the top equation. Of course, everybody's going to keep writing papers, including our group, but uh, still, it's nice to see that, how these things can be linked together. It suggests different ways that they combine and also the, the strengths of each. Okay, so um, that was static networks, and, and mo most of the literature is on static network modeling. In some sense, static networks are the hardest thing to work with. If you think about networks over time, you can start to do things like prediction and evaluate models in terms of how well they're predicting what happens next. And so uh, there's essentially two broad ways to look at dynamic networks, discrete time or snapshots, where we have, for example, say actors in a, in a school, and um, we're looking every month, we, the, you know, the social scientist goes in and measures who's friends with who this month. So the first year of students in a secondary school, uh, we're looking at how those friendships evolve. And so here often you're looking at how does the matrix, the Y matrix, evolve from discrete time to discrete time. And people like Tom Snyders in the Netherlands and Eric Ding at CMU and others have some nice ideas for this. Um, so if we, if we want to use latent variables here, um, which is, is natural, uh, then we can start out with our general form up here and you know one of the ideas is you may, you allow the z's to move around and put some dynamics on the z's and that could be Markov or it could be for example Andrew Moore and a student did some nice uh, sort of um, linear dynamics uh, for the latent space model different ways to do that uh, we did a, a some work where we looked at the uh, binary representation that uh, the original work by uh, Miller and Griffiths and Jordan, and we allowed uh, an individual's features in this latent space to uh, have a Markov dynamics over time. And so you might be, a uh, feature might be that you're interested in fishing or you're interested in soccer or something like that, but that might change uh, depending as, as, as you get older. So features can turn on, persist, or turn off and uh, you can do inference. I won't say much more than that, but basically um, you, you have tools that allow you now to uh, take the, these latent variable models and think about what kind of dynamics you want to put in them over time. In, in some sense, more interesting is the continuous time version of dynamic networks. And what I mean by that is that uh, every edge now has a, a timestamp with it. You may have birth death edges uh, where you know, you establish a friendship or you establish a relationship with somebody and then that lasts for maybe weeks, months, uh, what have you, but then it ends, uh, which would be one sort of continuous time. Also of interest though is instantaneous uh, edges. And an example would be uh, email communication or uh, instant messaging or text messaging and so forth. And so there's a lot of data like that. Um, we can always aggregate this data uh, if we want to. Um, 
So, but in a sense, you know, the aggregation can cause problems. At what unit of time should we aggregate? If we're looking at students sending uh, email or text messages to each other and we're a social scientist, uh, any, any level of aggregation is, is potentially problematic because we might miss some important feature of the data. So binning it by day or by hour or by week uh, could be potentially a problem. So we're interested in techniques that can actually look at the raw data without having to bin it at all. And here, uh, it turns out that, you know, classic ideas, what's the simplest idea for counts over time, so the Poisson stochastic process is, is very natural, and so in a sense, can we think of rates between individuals? So we have an individual, instead of thinking of a binary edge or a weighted edge between them, can we think of the relationship between them as, as a Poisson process where there's a rate at which they communicate, and that might change over time. And so this is, you know, how people kind of start with simple ideas and build up. And so, um, Yes, five minutes. All right, great, good. Uh, uh, and, you know, so we could think of just doing this, uh, if we had a small number of individuals and a huge amount of data, we could think of sort of a non-parametric kind of way of doing it. We just model each pair separately and come up with a Poisson rate and maybe we allow it to change over time. Um, the real problem here is that is n squared. You know, we, we, we're not lever we'd like a way to somehow combine information about individuals. Uh, if if the, the Poisson rate between me and Nello is something, then the Poisson rate between me and Peter maybe is related because I'm connected and they're connected, so we should be able to leverage that somehow. Um, so we'd like to parameterize this and do something more interesting than just using raw counts. And so one, one nice uh, model in this direction is by a colleague at UC Irvine, Carter Butts. Um, where again, you start to see the, the sort of statistical influence here of thinking of things in terms of regression equations. Lambdas, these lambdas for Poisson rates are non-negative, so we'll, we'll work with the log of them rather than uh, with the quantity itself, and that means the thing on the right can be positive or negative. And so we, here you have a sort, of a, um, sort of a network effect of how often do people communicate in general. And then relative to that, there is a communication rate for individual i, communication rate for individual j, and then some uh, parameters of the, basically some parameters and some features that represent what's going on in the network. So the features are specific to i and j. For example, um, are they, it's measuring maybe how persistent their conversations are, uh, turn taking, maybe static attributes of them, and then the betas are, are learn how important is it in this network, how are these important are these different features. So I'm probably not doing a great job at explaining this, but I think you're, you're getting the general gist of this, that these features here are changing over time depending on what's going on in the network. Um, the betas are telling us how important each one is, and so we're getting changes in the lambdas as, as the network goes forward. Uh, so you get this basically piecewise constant or inhomogeneous uh, network Poisson process. Uh, the likelihood is sort of interesting, and again, because it wasn't written by a machine learning data mining person in the original paper, it doesn't really point out that there's an n square term in here. At every, for every event, you look at all possible pairs of events, the edge that did happen at that time, and all n squared minus one that didn't happen. Um, and then you do that for every possible event, and you might have millions of emails being sent. So this, this algorithm does not scale up well, but there's computational tricks you can do. And a lot of the ideas here, if you're interested in this kind of stuff, they are, they're building on ideas from in, in a survival and event history analysis, basically taking those ideas, putting them in a network context, and uh, there's certainly some interesting techniques that I think we can, we can learn from there. Uh, we're looking at this for classroom dynamics uh, with an education um, professor at Stanford, Dan McFerland. Uh, interesting data set, we have multiple different sessions with multiple different people, we're using Bayesian techniques to pool information and using this relational event model. Uh, I'm not gonna say any more about that. Let me, let me get to the end here and uh, just advertise one other piece of work that we're currently doing. I, I talked earlier about Stephen Wolfram's email and we're, with a student I'm looking at, uh, our, you know, your own personal email history. Uh, what can it tell us about what's going on? You'd like to be able to take this data and also there's other information here about who were these emails being sent to, groups of people that were in contact with projects and so forth, and get some insight into, you know, what's email doing to our lives over time. And so we have a, a paper that's just coming out where uh, this is looking at different users, and I'll de-anonymize myself, I'm this user here, and this is over, I guess I forgot to put in the time axis, this is about five years in both of these cases, and this is about two years over here. Uh, this is the raw traffic, the raw counts, uh, and these are inferred groups and when the groups were active. So you'd see these groups become active 
uh, this person changed institutions, um, and th these, these groups then persist. Uh, just sort of um, good news for Peter and, and Nello and, and Tittle is this was when I was chair of the KDD conference, and the nice thing I noticed is as soon as the conference was over, the, the, the uh, traffic went to zero. I, I stopped answering emails about the conference. I figured, so you guys are on your own after uh, Friday, I think, if, if this is anything to go about. This is sort of another interesting one. It's a project, over, a project that was funded over five years, and of course it picked out that group and then looked at the Poisson rates for, for that group, and uh, I noticed there's, there was a lot more email in writing the proposal than there was in actually doing the project. I'm not going to say any more about that, but uh, I think professors will relate to that. Uh, so um, I'll give concluding comments and, and let us get to the museum for some, uh, some uh, uh, snacks and so forth. One thing, a few things I didn't comment on, just want to wrap up. The time complexity of the learning algorithms, which is actually a big deal, especially given what I started with, some large data sets. So just some notation, N is the number of documents or actors, V is the vocabulary size, K the dimensionality of the latent variables, L is going to be the average document length or average degree in networks, and T, if we have time data, the number of events. And so basically, these, this is the complexities, time complexities you get. So LDA per iteration, so all of these algorithms, EM, give sampling, or iterative, uh, N, and here we have an L, which is the average number of words per document or average degree, and, and that's good because uh, basically N times L is just the number of tokens that we have in the, in the document set times K. But when you go to many of these network models, this L becomes an N. Instead of looking at, in a document, the words that did appear, you're looking at, if, as it were, the, the words that did appear and all the words that didn't appear, or in the network, all the edges that didn't appear. So you get this N squared and definitely have to work around it. And then, as I mentioned in the relational event models, sometimes that's, there's a T put on, in, in, on top of that, which is all the possible events that could occur. Other things that people are probably, who know a lot about this, and people in the audience who've done a lot of work in this are probably squirming in their seats, say, he didn't mention, Dimensionality of the hidden variables, how do we select that? Well, there's a great work on non-parametric Bayesian techniques that I didn't talk about at all. You can do other Bayesian model selection things. Hyperparameters and smoothing. So uh, all of these multinomials, and I purposely left it out because I didn't want, there was just not enough time as the bells start to go, um, about with these priors, how do you pick them? Do you want to learn the hyperparameters? Uh, it's very important to see the paper by Wallach and Mimo McCallum and a paper from my group where this is discussed. And if you're using these models seriously, you should look at this and think about it, not just use out-of-the-box techniques. And then interpretability versus black box prediction. Uh, well, I'll leave that for, for talking afterwards. All right, I need to get off the stage here, but uh, hopefully I've convinced you that latent variable models are useful in analyzing what essentially are high-dimensional data sets with a lot of structure in them. Um, in the last 10 years, there has been a lot of progress. Um, in the representational aspect, this notion of multi-membership, that instead of objects be coming from a single cluster, that they can be sort of admixtures, composed of uh, mixtures of things, is, is very useful. And the learning algorithms are certainly been progress there. We can now learn these models fairly routinely from, from large data sets, although there are scalability issues. So there's many, many different models, and any conference you go to, there's, you know, LDA this and social network that, but there's really, you know, at least I would argue, only a few underlying key ideas. I mean, to get our papers accepted, we have to make them look as different as possible to each other, but if, you know, in, in a sense, there's only so many ways to, to skin the cat, and so uh, I'm hopefully convinced to you that there's, there's a few under, underlying ideas that, that underlie many of these models. Um, and in terms of research opportunities, I think there are underexplored areas. I think semi-supervised learning, say for LDA, is underexplored. I think dynamic networks, people are already realizing that's, that's a really rich area. There's a lot more to be done there. And I think uh, applications, for example, with the topic modeling stuff, instead of developing yet another graphical model with, you know, that's almost impossible to fit on a page, let's go find some real applications, some collaborators in social sciences and humanities. And, and some people are doing that. I think that's what, what needs to be done. All right, I'll leave a few pointers to uh, further work uh, that I got some of my ideas from and uh, finish at that point. Thank you. You mentioned that you assume that the data information in the static network is in condi conditional independent, but uh, I doubt that whether this assumption is sound because you know the, the formation of things might be con can, uh, might be dependent on the, the formation of other links, especially it might be proven by some social theories. So I wonder whether this kind of model could model this kind of phenomenon. Yes, excellent point. Um, all of these conditional independence assumptions are gross assumptions. They're essentially like naive Bayes and supervised learning. Um, I think, uh, you know, what, what, 
social scientists do and statisticians do is they approach it on a case-by-case -case basis. And if there's a, a, a data set where it's clearly grossly violated, then they wouldn't use a latent variable model with conditional dependence. But uh, I, 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 people have found um, that it's not, it's not too bad. It's, uh, you know, so it's the usual issue of uh, trade-off between a model that's parsimonious and we can work with versus it, it is a, a, a violating what's really going on. But maybe to first order it can capture what's, what's going on. So, but you're correct that it's, in the real world these assumptions will be, will be violated, certainly. And another question is in um, your welcome dynamic networks. Um, you mentioned that uh, the person rate is very varying, but how do you, how do you, I mean, how do you detect on and evaluate this kind of varying? I mean, is it possible to 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 estimate the real the real rate the real person rate and try to com compare this compare the radio estimated? Yeah, I think we can talk in detail afterwards about that, but there's a few different ways. In the email example I showed at the end, we do piecewise, we, we do a change point type of analysis where we look for significant jumps in the Poisson rates, which you tend to see, you know, for projects, suddenly there's a lot of activity and then, and then none. Um, in other cases, you, it can be more of a smooth process. So there's different ways that you can do it. And I'm happy to chat and point you, you know, in more detail, we can talk about that afterwards. Okay, thank you. Next question, do we have one? Anybody? Well, there will be time for you to chat with them in, a, in the reception there is. So is the next uh, meeting in the museum next door for the reception. Thank you very much. Thank you.